Uh, the RSA is delighted to be working in association with the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, Oxfam, DFID, World Vision and Islamic Relief to host this evening's event, the first in a new series of seminars addressing new perspectives on faith and development. As an independent, multidisciplinary organisation, the RSA is uniquely able to bring together people with different backgrounds, expertise and perspectives to explore the biggest challenges facing society today, of which global poverty is surely one of the most pressing. This seminar series offers an opportunity to address and challenge a wide range of issues from social and economic justice to ethical stewardship of the environment, from citizenship engagement to community building. These issues are of key relevance to the RSA's central mission, determining the role that citizens need to play in closing what we call the social aspiration gap, the gap between the world we aspire to, the society we must create if we are to deliver the common good, and how we actually act and think. By working in association with the partner organisations to host and disseminate these discussions, the RSA aims to translate new ideas and critical debate into practical change and to inspire audiences from the local to the global to be a force for civic innovation and social progress. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our chair for this evening's opening address, Karen Armstrong. Karen Armstrong is one of the world's leading commentators on religious affairs. She spent seven years as a Roman Catholic nun in the 1960s before leaving her teaching order to read English at Oxford she is now a best-selling author, broadcaster, and passionate campaigner for religious liberty and interfaith understanding. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Karen Armstrong. Thank you. A great pleasure and an honor to be here tonight in this first uh, of a, an important series. Um, run by the Tony Blair uh, Faith Foundation. Uh, why is it important? Because the issues of religion and public life have really come to the fore. And, they're off, and the relations between the two are often seen as highly problematic. Uh, there are those who would say that uh, re religion and development are virtually uh, mutually exclusive. You can't have one without the other. And very often the headlines tell us about the problems. And there are problems, and I'm sure these are going to be discussed uh, in detail over the next few weeks. Problems regarding health care, gender problems regarding the position of women, for example. All these are, they are not easy to solve. Uh, but, uh, and, and, and also there's the whole question of religion and violence. Uh, though one should understand uh, a kind of symbiotic relationship that I, as a historian, see between uh, a religiosity that is seen as violent and an equally violent secularism. Nearly every one of the uh, uh, sort of so-called extremist movements that we're seeing worldwide have developed in regions where warfare and conflict have become endemic. And in that case, religion has sometimes got sucked in and become a part of the problem. But there have been more and more positive uh, attempts to meld modernization uh, with traditional religion. Um, this happened in the United States in the 19th century when uh, the, most of the colonists were uh, Calvinists who couldn't appreciate at all the deist enlightenment faith of the American founding fathers. But they developed their own revolutionary Calvinism that enabled them to fight alongside. And the great prophets of the Second Great Awakening at the beginning of the um, 19th century, uh, weird and wonderful men with flowing beards looking like John the Baptist, would also quote Tom Paine um, and were introducing the people to the democratic ideal by pointing to the Gospels in a far more radical way, in some respects, than the Founding Fathers were ready for. Um, and, and if you look at the Muslim world, I think particularly of the great Grand Mufti of Egypt, Muhammad Abdu, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, who believed very passionately that the, most of the Egyptian people had no 
nothing, no, no familiarity at all with the modern Western ideas or the modern secularist institutions. Um, so he said, root them in Islamic law with which they're familiar uh, in such questions as shura, consultation, um, ijma, consensus, so that people, that these uh, Islamic principles will act as a kind of bridge uh, between uh, old and new and bring people to modernity in a package or in a capsule, if you like, in which they feel comfortable melding the two wor worlds. Um, so, and there have been many other such attempts. The British uh, uh, occupying forces were not very keen on this idea of Abdu, and it was, was dropped. But also, um, uh, Hassan al-Banna, founder of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, also uh, brought, translated the social message of the Quran into uh, a modern idiom, founding factories and clinics uh, run on Islamic principles, but also introducing the people uh, to modern trade union laws, insurance, decent holidays. Uh, again, melding the two world, worlds. This is what we need today. Not so that religion and politics, so often kept in watertight compartments, uh, can feed and help one another. Uh, and it's not an easy task. Uh, I'm sure you've already realized that, Mr. Blair. It's not an easy task. And the religions, too, need to be proactive uh, uh, in order to counter some of the negative press uh, using the res immense uh, resources and number of people who are longing for change and uh, development, indeed. My Charter for Compassion uh, is just such an attempt, an interfaith. Uh, a, a global effort endeavor involving all ranks of society uh, to bring uh, the golden rule back to the core of religion and morality uh, from which they've rather been ousted by secondary considerations. So we're in for a, a, a wonderful few weeks of uh, thought and discussion on this immensely uh, important topic. Uh, there's a lot to think about a lot to contemplate, a lot to argue about. But there can be few topics that are more important, and Mr. Blair is a brave man to have taken this on. So without more ado, um, obviously Tony Blair needs no introduction from me. Um, and so without more ado, I hand over the podium to him. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for having me along to um, the RSA. It's a, it's a particular pleasure to be here, obviously, uh, because of Matthew Taylor's connection, um, who was, uh, I think, it's described as my policy guru for a time. Uh, it was basically all his fault. I'd just like you to know that. Uh, and actually, he did a brilliant job, in fact, uh, for me. Um, and any of the fault was certainly on my side. But it's uh, wonderful to see what he's doing with this organization now, and it's a real pleasure to be with them, and, and with um, Karen Armstrong, who um, I have met now um, for the first time, but actually whose uh, books I have read over a long period of time. And as I said to her, I think that her work is amongst some of the most important being done in, in the world today. Uh, and it's a real privilege, actually, to be, uh, to be with you. Um, and also to, to say thank you to all the, the co-sponsors of the, of the series of lectures. Um, World Vision, Islamic Relief, um, Oxfam, and of course the Department for International Development, DFID. Um, DFID, when I was Prime Minister, I remember this is, this is DFID as a spirit all of its own. Those of you who are, anyone who's from DFID will recognize this. I remember a few years ago when I was Prime Minister visiting a country and DFID was very prominent there. And I needed some advice on something. I turned to a guy in the room and I said, are you with the government? He said, no, I'm with DFID. Uh, and I said to him, uh, I thought that was the same thing. He said, well, up to a point, he said. Um, they had that very independent spirit, but actually uh, the creation of DFID was a, an important moment for the government that I led and for the country. Um, 
It's given Britain reach and influence. It's helped shape the global debate on development. And most of all, it has driven change, saved lives, changed lives, in a way recognized across Africa and in many other parts of the world. We then, in part, use that strong voice to help put development on the agenda of the G8 for the Glen Eagle Summit in 2005. For the first time at such a summit, the topics were climate change and aid. And for the first time, we established a mechanism, the G8 plus five, which brought together the main emerging as well as developed nations of the world. Now, there were many intriguing aspects uh, of that summit, not least the cultural shock of Bob Geldof and Bono lecturing world leaders in a language they had not up to that point encountered. Um, but one of the most critical aspects, however, was the role played by people of faith. To place aid on the G8 agenda was not easy. I can tell you there was significant resistance to it. The commitments we were asking for were also significant. They related directly to the Millennium Development Goals set by the UN in the year 2000. But it was one thing to proclaim such goals. It was another thing entirely to follow them up with precise policy commitments. Now, not all of those commitments, as we know, have been honored. But there's no doubting the immense contribution that the increases in aid, the debt relief, and other policies made. There is also no doubt about the contribution the faith communities made to securing those commitments. Essentially, civic society across the developed world was mobilized, and within that society, the religious believers participated in churches and mosques, synagogues and temples. Week after week, they raised consciousness, put pressure on political representatives, and used their huge networks to push the issue's salience and profile. And believe me, as a political leader at the time, it mattered. It was a massive support, motivator, and galvanizer. It also touched upon a broader truth. Faith matters. It matters, in fact, whether you are religious or not, or even if you're anti-religious. It matters because it inspires people to act. Now, that can be for ill, as we see when extremism catches parts of the faith community. Or it can be for good, as with making poverty history. But the point is to ignore the role of faith is to be blind to a dimension of the world that plays a part in the thinking and attitudes of billions of people. Yet it also clearly presents dilemmas and can cause feelings of mistrust and opposition. This can be because of positions of some religious people on issues such as gender equality, especially in relation to issues like maternal mortality on which Difford is rightly running a big campaign, sexuality or contraception. It can also be because some people think that people of faith have always some ulterior motive to their good work through evangelizing or proselytizing or even conversion. I don't minimize any of these dilemmas, still less pretend they don't exist and at points give rise to sharp disagreements. It is also the case that religious organizations cannot and should not substitute for the central role of government. So we have to be realistic about the relationship between faith and development. But that same realism should also acknowledge what it is that faith can bring to the party. Now, when I began uh, the Tony Blair Faith Foundation, I had a very clear concept about how it should work. I did not want it to focus on religious doctrine or on trying to narrow theological differences between faiths. I wanted it to focus on action, on specifically what faiths together could do in action. Therefore, we have university and schools programs that link up students across the world in order to provide real life interaction between people of different faiths, not just learning about each other, but learning with each other, into faith, if you like, through experience. And we have begun a program to bring people together of different faiths 
in pursuit of the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. We've started with the anti-malaria campaign, and that's for a very simple reason. Roughly one million people die every year from malaria, mainly women and children, and it is preventable. We know what can prevent it. Bed nets, medicines, trained health workers. There is also brilliant work being conducted on a vaccine. But the truth is the right campaign can save lives. Where it is being implemented, and our foundation has first-hand experience of this, lives indeed are being saved. You can actually measure it in terms of lives saved from one year to the next as a result of these programs. So my foundation has trained a group of young people of faith from across the faith divide who are working together to mobilize their faith communities here in the West and link them with faith communities in the affected malaria regions. Many of these regions are remote. There are few or no health clinics or hospitals, but every village or town has a church or a mosque. These can be the distribution centers for the bed nets and the medicines and for where the health workers can give advice. Now, obviously what we do is only a small part of a much bigger picture, but the point is that the faith community here is making a contribution that in reality, in the practical living circumstances that apply in many of these countries, only the faith community can make. Of course, they do so in collaboration with many non-religious agencies, but their work, obviously, their faith makes a difference, occasionally makes the difference. So interfaith groupings are also attractive and desirable in a number of different ways. Governments in Africa find it easier to deal with the faiths together. The Nigerian Interfaith Action Association, which has just begun, made up of religious leaders committed to integrating their communities into national health plans, is a good example. Now, that was brokered this year by the Center for Interfaith Action in Washington, one of the partner organizations to my foundation, which, like us, is focused on ending deaths from malaria. And this association, begun in Nigeria, is led by the two main outstanding religious leaders, the Archbishop of Abuja and the Sultan of Sokoto. I was delighted to hear earlier this year that the World Bank has decided to give its support and funding for the work they do. Now, people will often say, but surely the faith community in doing development work lacks the capacity necessary. And the answer to anxieties about lack of capacity is to help them develop that capacity and those capabilities. And it doesn't make sense for the faith communities to do this in separation from each other. This is a core part of the vision of my faith foundation. Because when faith communities collaborate and work together for justice and human development, there is, if you like, almost a double payoff. Things get done, and respect and understanding between the faiths grows. Our concept is this, that a dialogue that moves from hands to hearts to heads complements what is normally understood as interreligious dialogue. The risk is a dialogue that begins heads to hearts does not always result in multi-faith action, or as the Holy Quran says, vying with each other in good works. But action together can aid that dialogue. For example, in Mozambique, there are already excellent programs training leaders from different faiths together so they can play their role in health education amongst their communities. Sierra Leone, where another part of what I do now um, in respect of, of governance, um, we're also active with, has inherited a very impressive interfaith organization from the times of the Civil War. And they're now using that to take up interfaith training for health education. Rwanda has a similar possibility. And in many countries, there are existing HIV AIDS networks that can be a great asset. Now, my point here is very simple. The potential is great. Faith communities given training, a small amount of funding, mobile phones, can provide government with basic, vital, missing data about the incidence of disease, 
the effectiveness of delivery of health care in parts of their populations where government often has negligible access. But there is so little research on what these communities need, even on what they're already doing, to know what interventions we require to make the faith communities more effective. I'm pleased that DFID is funding one of the first research consortia studying faith and development based at Birmingham University, and importantly, involving major research centers and universities in India and Africa. The South African-based RAP Research Network that has produced some outstanding country profiles in a series of mapping papers on the health work of faith communities is another example but we need to do much more. Religious leaders are also given a high level of trust, something that we as politicians know all about. Faith communities actually retain an immensely high level of social capital. A local Sufi Sawiya is not just a prayer center, but a job center. You sing and pray. You make the right contacts and meet the right people. The Muridiya network spread from a small town in Senegal in the 1920s, and today are there in Montreal, Paris, New York. World Jewish Relief, Islamic Relief, and Christian Aid recently got together and have highlighted the work that they are doing together. And their conclusions are contained in a valuable report from the Wolf Institute of Abrahamic Faith called Keeping Faith in Development. And one insight of this report is the importance of small symbolic acts. The personal donation from the local bishop of Juba to Islamic Relief, who were working in the predominantly Christian southern Sudan. The 200,000 pounds collected by World Jewish Relief after the 2005 Pakistan earthquake and given to an Islamic organization to help the victims. I would add to these the funds given by Islamic Relief to CAFOD for projects in El Salvador. Such gestures as this build up trust and understanding, both at the grassroots and internationally. But they're also, I think, the harbinger of a new type and level of commitment by people of faith working together for a development. So my point is that in this way, faith can benefit action for development but action on development can also benefit faith. It is true that the faith community has issues it must confront and overcome. It is true also that in recent years, most mainstream religious faiths have been prey to the influence of extremist groups who see faith as a badge of identity in opposition to those of a different faith. Even a short stay in Israel and Palestine where I now spend a lot of my time, would show you that all too graphically. But this, in a sense, is the dark side of strong belief. People who hold deep convictions about life and life purpose necessarily can be prone to holding those views to excess or to the point of prejudice. That danger is inherent in faith. But faith also, precisely because it is about profound belief, has resilience, commitment, dedication, the courage sometimes to go where others fear to go, a willingness to go beyond the normal bounds of compassion, and above all, a clear moral purpose. So yes, some of the worst actions of recent times have been committed by people of faith, but also some of the best. Provided each side in faith and development approaches the other with a little humility, there is a lot that the faith community and those who work in development can learn from and with each other. For those who promote development, they can achieve greater depth and penetration of policy and action. They can gain from the networks and the reach of the faith communities. But for those of faith, they can do as they see it, God's work more effectively. And in doing that work, if it is done in cooperation and partnership with those of another faith, also come closer to understanding and respecting diversity. When I began my foundation, 
I would, from time to time, say that we needed the foundation to promote greater tolerance between those of different faiths. I now don't use the word tolerance in this context. Actually, we shouldn't tolerate those of a different faith. We should be humble enough to accept that we cannot either circumscribe or define adequately God's will. So though we may disagree with those of another faith, though we hold true to our own faith, we should not have the arrogance merely to tolerate a person whose faith is different, but instead respect them as an equal. The best way to encourage such an attitude is to let it develop naturally. And the best way for it to develop naturally is for people of different faiths to express their values together in action. So I think it's right that we are now beginning to analyze and reflect on this issue and the relationship between faith and development. Faith and development in harness would have been enormous historic breakthrough. Now it's true, there are difficulties. The MDGs involving women, for example, are proving intractable. And in this sense, DFID's commitment to doubling funding of faith communities, given in its recent white paper, is both a vote of confidence and something of a challenge. But there is a need for an informed public debate about how an understanding of development efforts can be better informed about the role of faith. Each of the sessions in this series is designed to be an open, honest, and if necessary, critical discussion about the role that faith can play across all aspects of development. And then later this week, at Yale University, where my foundation also has a partnership, we will be bringing together practitioners, funders, and religious leaders from nine African countries, from the US and the UK, to look at how to overcome some of the practical barriers and challenges. The Observer journalist, Anthony Sampson, liked to tell a story from his time as a ghostwriter for the 1980 Brent Report. The report, you will remember, was the product of an international commission containing leading development experts as well as politicians. And it was seen at the time as a major contribution to the analysis of the problems of international development. After it was done and dusted, Sampson asked Willie Brandt about how he felt about the report. Too many economists, not enough anthropologists, was Willie's somewhat cryptic reply. He meant, of course, that the report had not paid enough attention to the importance of culture and religion in determining outcomes in development. Now, Willie Brandt, whatever his faults and his virtues, and his virtues were certainly huge, but excessive religiosity was not exactly one of his characteristics. But he saw that the developing world was steeped in religious ideas and practice, and that we neglect them at the cost of effective development. At the time, of course, the secular world of econometrics and development experts, on the whole, simply didn't get that part of the equation. Now, when we then came to publish the Africa Commission in the run-up to Glen Eagles, we tried quite deliberately to rectify this by inserting a chapter into it specifically on these issues. And the remarkable thing is that when we came to analyze religious practice and belief in many African societies, we found that those had increased with urbanization and the decline of so-called traditional society, quite unlike the trajectory in Europe. The chapter is called Through African Eyes, and I commend it to you, because we really do need to, the ability to see development through African eyes as well as our own. And the truth is that those eyes are to a large extent, a significant extent, governed by the world of faith. As I always say, the chief characteristic of today's world is its interdependence. Nothing from the financial crisis to climate change could be achieved except by nations acting in unison. Such global action, based on global alliance, 
is impossible when you think about it without some sort of shared global values. Climate change, in particular, will require action that is effective, but there is no chance of that happening unless the action is also equitable as between developed and developing world. Indeed, I would argue that the major unifying value needed for global alliances is a sense of justice, and justice universally accepted, applied, and decreed. Now, such a view is, of course, not confined to people of faith. But the concept of justice is nonetheless possibly the single biggest point of unity of all the major faiths. Religions, after all, were the world's original globalizers. Their influence is not diminished and may even be growing. So, in conclusion, this is a debate that is vital. If it's approached in the right way and with the right spirit of cooperation and understanding and the willingness to confront some of the really difficult and challenging issues that surround the world of faith and its relationship to development, then it can, over time, be a debate that is transformative. I spent a long time as British Prime Minister trying to push the issues of development. And we had a certain amount of success. But in general terms, what I learned as much as anything else about government was not just what government could do, but also the limitations of what government can do. And in particular, increasingly, I saw the role of civic society and the actors in civic society as essential to achieving any of the aims that we wanted to achieve. The faith community is such a major part of civic society that its impact, for good or bad, is of extraordinary significance and importance. I think there is a willingness within the faith community to reach out, not just to help in the process of development, but also to be educated about what that process of development requires. If that is true, then such a debate and such a closer cooperation can indeed be transformative. And now is surely the time to start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Blair. Uh, I, in a moment, I'm going to throw the discussion open to the floor. Um, but first, I'd just like to ask you, um, have you found any resistance, say, in the Middle East uh, when uh, you and your foundation approach people? Is there suspicion of the West? Of, of, um, uh, oh, and, 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 and Because one of the big difficulties, and I'm sure this is true in, in politics too, is who convenes this? Um, you know, faith, interfaith gatherings are often split on the subject of who is calling people to the table. Have you run into this at all? Yeah, for sure. But I think, on the other hand, though, I think the, the desire for interfaith understanding is somewhat over, overcoming that. Um, and actually, I mean, specifically, this is, I mean, although it does, does have relevance to development, of course, in, in, in Palestine. Um, but specifically in relation to the, the, the Middle East, you know, I don't know how you resolve a question like Jerusalem ultimately unless there's some contribution made f by people of faith. And, you know, sometimes people say to me, oh, it's not really anything to do with um, religious faith, this problem. And I say, well, <laughs> you know, you may think not, but unfortunately the people in this uh, part of the world think it is. And actually when you're, you know, because my office is uh, in, in Jerusalem, uh, you only have to look out of the window and you see the faith divide very clearly um, and also the importance of it. So I think, yes, it's true that there is uh, resistance 
Um, actually, there's a resistance in the West as well, to be absolutely frank about it. There's but, you know, what, one of the things I learned is that if you pay too much attention to, re to resistance that people have to, to discussing an idea, you know, nothing ever gets done. So you might as well um, just, just wear all that, but, but it, it is an important debate to have. And I also think that there are many people, um, lay people within uh, religion who, you know, lay people who are themselves religious, who, who see in development the strongest sense of vocation that they could have um, in terms of a, a, a cause that they should respond to because of their religious beliefs. So in the end, yeah, you get resistance, but actually I, I, I think the good news is there is a lot more on the other side now of the, of the, of the pressure. I love the stress on action rather than belief. I think, uh, that I think there's far too much emphasis on beliefs and uh, opinions, and I think if people work together these things, you learn understanding and appreciation. Have you, uh, you've spoken of the three Abrahamic faiths. Have you made incursions into the Hindu or the Buddhist world? Or yes, I mean, we've, we've got, I mean, we essentially focus on six uh, faiths, so the Abrahamic faiths and Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism. Um, whenever I say this in any gathering, someone always comes up to me from another faith and says, yeah, uh, but we had to start somewhere. This is, these, these are the faiths we started with. But yes, there's a, a, I mean, there's a deep commitment uh, in Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism. And actually, um, those faiths sometimes are, are, funnily enough, more willing to, to reach out across the faith divide than the Abrahamic faiths. Um, but he, here's the thing that I think is really interesting, that the best interfaith dialogue and understanding comes when people don't feel pressure to engage in a theological debate, but are learning about the other person from a personal point of view. In other words, you know, if you're engaged, and this, is, this happens with our, you know, the, 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 um, the young people that I was talking about who go out to Africa and then come back to their faith communities and operate in pairs, one of different faiths, the thing is they, they work together. So that is their, as it were, that's their kind of day job, right? They work together. So they're not sitting there talking about, well, my gospel says this or my creed says that or whatever. They're working together. So that's the important thing. However, the feedback we've already got is that, of course, at the end of the day, in a relaxed way, they'll talk about their, their religion. So there's a greater understanding that, he, that they have. And the misunderstandings people have about each other's religious faith are, are, I mean, they are very profound. I mean, I, I mean in the Western world, not in the developing world. I have come across stuff taught in various, you know, educational situations about, about faith, which is really frightening in terms of what people are being taught. Um, and actually, the best teaching you get is from a, a direct interaction. So in our schools program, I mean, the other day, we linked up a school in Delhi with one in Bolton and one in Palestine. Which is quite an interesting uh, cultural mix. And, um, you know, the interesting thing is the moment the young people get talking about their own faith together, you, you, they get a far clearer understanding. And the other thing is that they don't actually then drop their own faith and <laughs> go off for another. They, if anything, their own faith becomes strengthened by some sense of, of where the religiosity of others are. 